Four people in my family. My brother Peter, my sister Elise, my brother Rocco, and me. I was the youngest of four. And my mother and my dad were there every step of the way. I'm here to tell a story about my brother that hopefully um, somebody or many of you can learn from that story uh, and carry it on into your own life. My brother Peter, and I'll get to this, had two kids and couldn't stop. Two kids. Rodgers to the end zone. Good touchdown, Marciano. Just very sad and, uh, to learn of Peter's passing. I got the news last evening and uh, was an assistant coach here during pre- Peter's career. Peter was a tremendous football player on the field, a feisty, tough, competitive guy, good return guy, and a uh, uh, tough receiver. But I think well beyond that, uh, you know, he was a guy that was really uh, respected and, and beloved by his teammates and coaches. Uh, very colorful personality. Always a uh, guy that had something uh, interesting to do or say, and uh, usually pretty entertaining. So, but the bottom line was just a you know true Hawkeye, a tough, competitive guy that loved the uh, loved the game and loved his teammates. Well, I think that the opioid epidemic that we're dealing with here in Plymouth County is shows you how di- how diverse this problem is. In that. Um, it doesn't just occur in a city, say, as Brockton. Uh, it doesn't just occur in a small town as Rochester. It can occur everywhere. Opioid addiction has no zip code. So therefore, we have to deal with the issue throughout our county and deal and bring into all of our groups information that they're going to be able to help getting ourselves in front of the problem. Opioid fatality started to rise sometime in 2012. And we saw a spike uh, at that time And we also saw a corresponding spike here in the county of Plymouth, where we saw the numbers start to go up. And very shockingly, as a matter of fact, because over the years, we've seen them go from uh, from a a low number of 35 to our high number back in 2016 of 142. And notwithstanding a lot of good people and groups and agencies trying to get involved with this problem, the numbers continue to escalate. When we talk about addiction, um, there's this false sense of an understanding that it's a moral failing and it's this choice and why don't people just stop doing drugs? So my name is Amanda Sandoval, I'm the Assistant Director of Prevention Services for High Point Treatment Center and the Brockton Area Opioid Abuse Prevention Collaborative. So basically what that means is it's a really long way to say that I do substance use prevention grant funded work um, throughout nine communities in Plymouth County. We work with parents, people in recovery, people in treatment, um, anyone who's willing and able to be at the table, we want them to be there. So we do um, education and trainings and try to raise awareness. We make policy change uh, recommendations. and continue to try to advocate for this epidemic. My brother went on to be an unbelievable football player at Brockton High School, was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to the University of Iowa. He was an amazing, amazing athlete. He was returning a punt. He hurt his shoulder his uh, senior year in college. And he went to the doctors, you know, the trainer, and they prescribed him Percocets. And my brother um, went from using Percocets to treat his pain to, on a Friday night, let me have a couple Percocets and I'll drink two or three beers. And what happened was he fell into this routine. So now what became, it went from treating pain to taking him on a Friday night to feel good, to catch a buzz, to waking up on Saturday morning feeling like crap, and the only way that he could feel better was by taking another painkiller. My name's Dan Muse, I'm an emergency physician from Canton, Mass. I've, uh, over the last few years, been spending a lot of time working with Plymouth County District Attorney's Office, as well as the local police on the opioid crisis. Actually, this came to me. I am the medical director for several uh, fire departments, and 
back in 2013, uh, Stoughton, a, a neighboring town to Canton, had uh, three overdoses uh, with deaths over Labor Day weekend. And at that point in time, Chief Paul Shastany wanted to become part of the DPH pilot program. Um, unfortunately, they thought he didn't have enough deaths in his town, and they told him no. Ultimately, as medical director for the, the fire department, they asked me if I would assist him, and I couldn't see any reason why you wouldn't. So I helped him train his police officers, and at that point in time, a law uh, came back stating that first responders, or an interpretation of the law said first responders were not held liable if they used Narcan to help people save their lives. All of a sudden, painkillers weren't enough for him. So we started chopping up Oxycontins and snorting Oxycontins. My brother finally hits rock bottom, or so he thought what was rock bottom, and says, you know what, I'm done. I'm gonna quit this. He goes back into another rehab center. He comes out of the rehab center. Uh, he goes five years clean, five years. So my name is Kevin Avitabli. I'm the director of alternative programs for Plymouth Public Schools. Uh, previously, I was the adjustment counselor for Plymouth North for the last five years or so. Um, and so my experience with addiction comes both professionally, uh, working in a school district with at-risk youth, the majority of, of the kids that I work with, um, have issues with mental health, substance abuse, or behavioral issues, and then has uh, personally uh, been affected by both my brothers overdosing uh, and passing away within the last four years or so. The following is something I wrote with no intention of it being heard, but tonight I will share a few thoughts into a mind and life significantly altered by the impacts of drugs without ever personally doing them. In my heart, I need to make sense. I need answers that I will never get. I will wander the rest of my days with questions unasked, a constant emptiness that will fill my soul. No matter the substitute, it can never complete because the disease, the disease of addiction has sealed our fate. Memories, memories of eulogies tear up my night falling like raindrops, blurring up my sight. I know that to pressure must have weighed a ton, but how could you not think of our mom, me, or your son? The addiction so powerful and all encompassing, the constant devil on your shoulder, preying on your weakest moments. It's never enough, and your last time is never the last. He will push and pull until he gets his way, corrupting your thoughts, convincing you it's okay. Um, so, I mean, my younger brother was uh, a star athlete. Um, you know, I played Division One football. I played uh, Division Two football. I have friends who played in the NFL or played in, you know, Canadian League or who played professionally at a very high level. And he was the best athlete, football player that I have ever played with in my entire life. I mean, he was just he was a phenomenal athlete. Uh, our sophomore year, he had a string, or his sophomore year, freshman going into sophomore year, he had a string of kind of injuries that led to him being prescribed uh, pills pretty rapid, rapidly over the course of like a six month period of time. He was probably prescribed uh, pain medication three or four times over that time, whether it was a broken collarbone, he broke his hand, um, you know, I think he tore his knee up, you know, so he was kind of just getting hurt more and more. And, and from that point of his sophomore year where he was starting as a freshman and dominating, you know, even me and my friends, uh, he, within a year and a half, he had dropped out of high school. Uh, he had totally lost interest in everything that he was, he was, he was really excelling in, whether it was school where he was in, you know, uh, honors classes, whether it was on the sports field, everything that he had was gone within a matter of like 18 months. You know, this has become much more prevalent. In other words, substance abuse is an issue that people want to just put under the carpet. They want to ignore and they want to blame it on, quote, the junkie or whatever. And, you know, they had a coming type of attitude. And you could see this changing because kids that they were coaching were now addicted to opioids and they were using other drugs and the neighbors and, and maybe even a family member and it became extremely prevalent and so the ones who were at one point in time just you know ignoring it were now very concerned about it in particular law enforcement from top to bottom and one police officer came to me and he was talking about how he arrested a kid um, and they were walking back to find the gun that was he hid in the woods and he said you know 
you probably think I'm a scumbag. And he said, no, I, I don't make any opinion about you. And he said, well, you know, I used to be a national honor student, uh, played sports at a very high level in high school, was looking to play in college, um, and then I got hurt. And this is where I am today because of those pills. What we've determined during the course of our review of the fatalities that occur in Plymouth County is that our, our age group has gone down. And what that's indicative to us is that the people that, for the most part, that, that are passing away from this, this problem are between the ages of 20 and 29. A couple years back, it was between 30 and 39. And I think what that's showing us is we're developing into a new problem because a lot of people have children at the time of 20 to 29, and now we're dealing with that next step. I think many things that we try to do here in the district attorney's office is get in front of cycles. We try to get in front of the cycle of domestic violence. We try to get in front of the cycle of child abuse. What we're going to see shortly, I believe, is a cycle of drug endangered children. Kids who are not using drugs themselves, but have lost their parents or parent, and now they're either being raised by their grandparent or some other legal guardian. And I think that is a real thing for us to focus on right now to help the people who have this addiction. Our brain doesn't know the difference between prescription like Oxycontin or Oxycodone or Vicodin or Codeine and heroin. Heroin has the same chemical makeup as do these prescription opioids that are being prescribed. One day he's in a car with a guy and the guy says to him, Peter, you gotta try this stuff, it's unbelievable. He sticks a needle in his arm for the first time. Only this time, he's married, he's got two kids, young kids. Sticks a needle in his arm. After he stuck that needle in his arm, and, I, and I'll continue this theme of, you have one chance. And that one chance goes back to college when he decided that he was gonna start chewing Percocets for recreational purposes. More people are dying in this country from overdose than they are from car accidents. So it's actually the leading cause of unnatural death in this country for the first time. What we're trying to do is create this, the Drug Abuse Task Force and make it a clearinghouse. Best practices, best ideas, data collection. Make sure we can enhance the capability of the programs that we're dealing with right now. Make sure at the same time we can also reach out through education, try to get to our kids at a younger age to make sure they understand the dangers that they're facing. We need to continue to go after the drug dealers, the traffickers who are peddling this poison that is killing people right now. And we need to make sure that the prosecutors continue to have the minimum mandatories to make sure we can put the dealers, not the users, where they belong. That's off the streets and in jail. And I think by working together, we're going to be able to have this sort of focused approach and making sure we can keep people safe. So playing college football, uh, especially in the early 2000s, I mean, pain medication was it was a system to get us back on the field. I mean, playing football in college, constantly we were dealing with injuries, constantly we were trying to get back on the field as fast as we could, and we were pushing through pain. Especially back in the early 2000s, like if you got hurt, it, it was expected that you were to get back on that field as soon as possible. So you were doing everything that you could to try and figure that out. Um, and, and pain medication was a part of that, absolutely. It was uh, part of that in college, it was a part of that in high school. Um, you know, the education wasn't there, we didn't really know what we were doing, we just knew that it made the pain go away, which made us get back on the field faster. A lot of times when we talk about addiction amongst young people, we, we don't consider the young person's voice, and a lot of times young people are the ones who realize that their friends are using before a teacher, before their family, before anybody else. And so actually as a resource, we've created um, how to help a friend. Um, and that resource talks about what do you say, what don't you say, um, what might the signs and symptoms look like for a person who is struggling with a substance use disorder or the beginning phases of that, and then what are the local resources, how can I, how can I access that, or where can I get some more information about my friend if I'm concerned about them. A lot of times when we talk about sports, we think of it as a protective factor because of the relationships with a coach or the relationships with those teammates and being physically active. And yes, that, that is a protective factor. But a lot of times we forget that it's also a risk factor because a person who's playing sports constantly can 
put themselves at risk to develop a, a sports injury. Um, and so if a person gets injured playing a sport, they more than likely are going to be prescribed some sort of prescription painkiller or opiate. These prescription painkillers are highly addictive and so if those individuals know that these medications are addictive then they might be able to avoid taking that and take the alternative like some Motrin or Tylenol. My brother Peter couldn't stop doing heroin for his own children. His wife was in rehab. His wife was in rehab. My brother was home alone with his kids on, a, on, a, um, on December 21st. At 5.30 that night, a family friend of ours, a guy named Richie Cogliano, whose son was supposed to be babysitting for Peter because Peter had to go to work that night, uh, went over to the, his house there was no answer at the door. There was no kids there. Five o'clock at night, mind you. Okay? Kids were supposed to be out of school at three. No one there to pick them up. Sitting at the school all alone. Seven years old and five years old. My mother barely let me walk, walk home from school. And my school was at the back door right there. Alone. Two kids sitting at, sitting at the school all alone. Thankfully, because of the beautiful teacher's that are in the Brocken school system. They took care of him. He knocks on the door. No answer. He looks through the window and he sees my brother lying on the kitchen floor. He kicks the door in, he walks in, and he's dead. With my brothers, or oh, both of my brothers, I think the first time that they took it, they knew that it was a problem and that it escalated into something that I don't think any of us anticipated it ever would. You know, we came from a good family. We had a, a strong upbringing. We knew that addiction ran in our family. You know, our, my mother and father used to talk about it all the time with their uncles being, you know, drinking or this or that. Or, and so we knew it was, it, was a, it was a risk. But I don't think we really understood what that meant. If we continue to break that stigma and continue to raise awareness and say, yes, not a single one of us has not been affected by this. Um, I think that people will be more comfortable and more apt to reach out for help, to go get that help that they need and, and essentially save a life. We are a group of individuals who don't proclaim to have all the answers, which is why we sit around and talk to the people who are involved with the, pro the programs that we're dealing with. That's why we have faith-based people at our table. That's why we have legislators, judges. That's why we have law enforcement. That's why we have um, the variety of groups that we need to make sure we continue to work together with. That's why we've reached out to hospitals to try to make sure that we have data collection that is accurate because even though we have and we have watched our numbers here in Plymouth County go up with the fatal opioid overdoses, I also know that those numbers are not correct. From Richie Cogliano, he said, Stephen, you need to get to your brother's house right now. I jumped in my car, I called my brother Rocky, and I said, Rocky, I think Peter died. I, I'm on my way to come get you. And I get up, I drove in my car, and I drove over to pick my brother up. The most difficult thing I have ever had to do in my lifetime in something that is seared into my mind till the day I die was I had my brother Rocky on the phone I had my sister Elise on the phone and I called my mother at 5.30 at night and I said and I'll never forget it and I said hi mom I don't call my parents at 5.30 at night I talk to my parents every day I talk to them in the morning I said, hi, Mommy. She was so happy to hear from me. Hi, Stephen. And I said, Mom, uh, is Dad with you? Yeah, of course he is. Is everything all right? And I said, no. No, it's not all right. And she said, what? And I said, Mom, Peter's dead. In the scream that came from my mother is something that I will never forget for as long as I live. It will live in my mind painfully 
till the day I die. Peter was my godfather. Um, he was a special guy. Anyone that you talk to will say the same thing. He just could make you feel so special and loved the second he walked into the room. Um, I guess I never really knew growing up that he was addicted or was struggling with substance use. Um, I always just knew that he wasn't really around as much as maybe we would love him to have been. I didn't get into this job because of Peter, um, but I don't think that it's a coincidence that my life's work is opioid use and overdose prevention and that's ultimately what took his life. Um, I think that there's a greater purpose. You know, we were duped by Purdue Pharmaceutical Company that set up a whole charade that virtually forced physicians into changing their practices. Uh, they lied to the public, they lied to physicians, and we ultimately were in a position where even the federal government was saying, if you don't treat the pain, then you're going to be penalized. So we started to get very liberal with narcotics. And at the same time, insurance companies were saying, well, you can't see that person for about a week post-surgery. So you know what? What are you going to do if the kid's in a lot of pain? Because if they come to the office, they're not going to get, the, uh, they're not going to get paid for it. So ultimately what happens is you had to make sure they had enough pain medication that they use them judiciously. Now put on top of that, that as a physician, we are still held in high esteem. And therefore, if the doctor says it's okay, it has to be okay. And ultimately what was happening is we were creating multiple young adults with substance abuse disorder and ruining their lives. Looking at my brother and, and seeing what potential that he had to become something, it was all ripped apart because of drugs and, and addiction. And I think those stories, I could walk through the halls of, of this high school or any other high school across the field and I could pick out kids with potential here or potential there who will never fulfill that potential because of something that they're putting in their body and that they don't understand what the, the ramifications of that, what they're putting in their body could do to the, to the impact of their whole life. Prescription drug monitoring program sort of had these it's, it's a great resource and it's, it's sort of for pharmacists, it's, they're the last line of defense. Um, pharmacists can check it before they actually give the prescription to a person. If the doctor didn't happen to um, check the PMP or, or, or catch something in the computer system, um, the pharmacists also have access to it to make sure that those individuals aren't accessing additional prescription pills. Um, the unintended consequences of the PMP are that a person is no longer being able to access their prescription opioids, so then they might turn to heroin. And so as we're, we're preventing the prescriptions being put out, more people are, are wanting to or needing to access heroin. Because that phone call that parents talk about with young kids like you who are out driving in a car and they say, oh, I can't even imagine getting this phone call. I had to make that phone call. So the decisions that you're making and the decisions that you're going to make in your life, I want you to clearly understand the decisions that you make and the effect that they have on your mom and dad or your loved ones and how much it affects your loved ones. There's a national drug take back day that takes place twice a year, put on by the DEA. Um, Brockton participates in that. Um, and there's also at all of the local police departments, there is a medication drop box where somebody can go and get rid of those medications, no questions asked. Any unused, unwanted, expired medications can just be brought to the local police station and put into this what looks like a mailbox and get rid of them and get them off the streets and then the DEA, DEA um, incinerates them. Leadership is more than words. It's your actions. How many people in the stands uh, want to grow up to be a drug addict? I don't see any hands. Because that's never anybody's goal life, right? Make the right decision. 
We all come to that pass in our life where we have to make decisions. You're getting to that pass if you're not there already. Make the right decision because it may be your last decision. Marciano at the 10. Finds an opening. Marciano still on his feet. He may go. Only him and the kicker between them. Marciano breaks it upfield to the 30, the 20, the 10. Marciano for the score. Peter Marciano, 89 yards, and Iowa is back in this ballgame.